Right, welcome everybody. We've got yet another wonderful session lined up for you today with somebody who is no stranger to the program and no stranger to the University of the Underground. For those of you not uh, familiar with the program, it's titled New Politics and Afrofuturism, where we're calling for black radical imagination and popular culture as powerful vehicles for propelling progressive social justice narratives to mainstream audiences with a focus on Afrofuturism's black activism, art and culture, climate justice, along with political theory and practice. And for those of you also not familiar with the University of the Underground, it is a free, pluralistic and transnational university, which is based in the uh, underground nightclubs in Amsterdam. But as you can see, due to the current pandemic, we are all going online. So the title uh, of this session, lecture, whatever you want to call it, is titled Climate Anthropocene. And our wonderful uh, guest educator, lecturer, his name is Tom Burke. He is a former student of the University of the Underground, as well as a host of lots of other amazing things like a musician, creative director, and curator of live experiences. Tom activates new models of collaboration between theatrical, musical, film, and political philosophy practices. He has curated and produced live experiences for the British Film Institute, Excel Recordings, British Council, as well as many other things. And his band, The Citizens, released two albums and the song Rose sorry, and Rose to Fame with their hit single and video True Romance. They have toured worldwide, including live performance at Glastonbury Latitude, Reading and Leeds, South by Southwest, as well as a host of other places, including Tokyo too. The Guardian wrote that his work is fantastic and likely to induce widespread street dancing. I think that's an absolutely incredible endorsement. <laughs> he directs music videos and continues to work with musicians of varying genres. Tom also often collaborates with his wonderful wife and Chilean architect, Carla, Aldo Carla Aldonate. I'm sorry for butchering her name if I have Tom. No, you got it right. Brilliant, thank you. And they also practice between London, Santiago and Amsterdam. Tom, and as always, we are very grateful and for you taking the time out to share your wisdom and thoughts with us and thank you very much and I'll hand the floor over to you. Great, thank you very much Majid. Um, well good morning everyone, it's good to see everyone. Um, thanks for being here and uh, sharing your time with me. Um, so yeah we're going to do a making workshop today. Uh, which is a chance to experiment with uh, a way of uh, making and uh, research through making, which some of you may be used to, some of you may not be used to. Um, and I'll go through uh, a kind of workshop brief in a little while, but first of all, I want to um, introduce myself and talk to you about uh, a project the, that I worked on, which is actually my graduation project from when I was a uh, master's student at the University of the Underground. It's uh, essentially a music um, film uh, which started its life as, a, as an audio piece, a podcast. And hang on, I will um, share my screen and my sound and I will talk you through it. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Yeah, thumbs up. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> And if I play some audio from my computer. What did this person say? I said, you can hear that as well. Okay, great. All right. In that case, we're good to go. Right. So I made a film uh, in collaboration with a community uh, called the uh, Comunidad Agricola de Peña Blanca, which is an agricultural community in uh, Chile in South America. And uh, I'm going to tell you how that project came about and uh, what I was trying to achieve in collaboration with this uh, particular community. So just a little bit of background about myself. As Majid explained, I'm a uh, I studied English and literature when I was a student at university. And then I had a career in music. Um, 
sorry, this deck seems to be quite low quality, but look, there's a picture of me as an indie boy in much younger days. And here is a still of um, a, a music video that we worked on uh, with a, a company called We Are From LA from, uh, for a song that was called True Romance. And I guess the reason why I'm showing you that is because that was something that was um, kind of a turning point. It was the first time that uh, we worked with people who, who seemed to have um, a kind of storytelling methodology that was really uh, based in research and that was political in, in the, the sense that it was, um, it was concerned, concerned with the politics of appearing in public space. Um, the video was based on a, a photograph that was taken during the Vancouver um, riots back in about 2006, where this couple were pictured on the floor. They kind of looked like they're in, a, in an embrace. Um, actually, the, the guy was helping the girl who had injured herself, but it looks as if they're in this kind of romantic embrace while this uh, chaos and violence is happening around them. And they kind of uh, ran with that idea and they had uh, scenes of a lot of people, um, uh, a lot of people kissing uh, in, in kind of scenes where sort of uh, violent oppression was taking place and it, it sort of took off online. And um, it was the first time that I was involved in something that uh, really seemed to... Um, provoke in a in a in a political way and I suppose that's um it also showed me how powerful the music video is in the 21st century how much reach it has and so I'm mentioning that because I think it's something that then informed why I wanted to make uh why I wanted to keep working with music and audio and film when I uh ended up at the University of the Underground so um yeah, and I'm also gonna share with you um, a, something that Nelly uh, repeated to us um, endlessly while we were studying uh, in Amsterdam, which was, uh, she would always say, less talking, more making. And I remember being really annoyed with her every time she said that. But um, since, uh, since you know, my time at University of the Underground, it's, not, it's one of the things that I, I, I remember most of all, and I suppose the point is that, um, you know, it's a very ambitious program. It encourages you to think uh, in very ambitious and uh, broad reaching ways and to engage in a small kind of practical experiment can just feel profoundly inadequate. Um, but when looking back and, and in my practice now, whenever there's a choice between theorizing, uh, endlessly talking or engaging in some kind of practical making, doing experiment, however small and inadequate it may seem at the time, um, the more fruitful outcomes, outcomes always come from the, from the making. Uh, especially these things, uh, they have a cumulative effect. Of course, you know, you need a balance, but um, essentially I'm, uh, what I'm gonna go on to describe the process that I, that I went through if I hadn't been prepared to engage in little making experiments, which uh, added up on top of each other, I would have got nowhere. So I was in my, uh, starting my second year on the University of the Underground MA, and um, I was going on a lot of uh, uh, sort of climate marches. I was sort of involved to an extent with Extinction Rebellion, but I was feeling very uncomfortable about um, the kind of language and the, the way in which um, I felt as if uh, climate issues were represented sort of within that movement. Um, and, and elsewhere I was, I was interested in, uh, I was doing a certain research into monsters um, and histories of monsters in, 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 uh, in representation. And there was a moment where these two things sort of came together. I think, we'd, I think Nelly had organized a workshop that was, that was uh, around monsters and, and monstering. And this idea of the monster as the disturbing hybrid, um, something whose externally incoherent body resists attempts to include them in any systematic structuration. The monster is dangerous, a form suspended between forms that threatens to smash distinctions. So the, the horror of the monster or the power of monstrosity is the fact that it, it presents a challenge to the status quo. So uh, the, the taxonomies and the, the knowledge structures of power are threatened by this thing that they, they somehow find to be unclassifiable, right? That doesn't fit neatly into the, 
the knowledge structures that they've delineated. So the monster is always something that is other and that is elsewhere and that is pointed at. And it's something uh, that is defined um, by the, um, from the position of the, uh, of the status quo of uh, normality, of uh, the power base. And um, it's something that has to be eradicated in order to maintain the status quo. Unless, of course, it's uh, you know a term that's reappropriated in the manner of Susan Stryker or even I don't know Lady Gaga, um, but I don't think that's how the term is being used here. So I woke up and I saw this uh, headline in the Guardian. It said Earth's climate monsters could be unleashed as temperatures rise. So I thought there was a problem here. Uh, you know what happens when you're monstering climate essentially? Um, what uh, uncategorizable? dangerous um, hybrid are you pointing at and perceiving uh, when you talk about the climate monster? Um, where are you looking to? Where are you looking from? And um, how do you intend to eradicate this thing so that the status quo can continue unimpeded? Um, Okay, I'm just gonna take a moment out because what I actually got into then was a, a kind of a storytelling project um, based around this idea of the monstering of climate. But I'm just gonna take a moment to uh, define a few terms maybe. So first of all, you know, what is climate? Um, you know, it's defined as a prevailing set of conditions in a particular place over a particular period of time. Of course, uh, you know, generally we think of polite climate as um, weather, but the more I've spoken to uh, activists, the more I've spoken to uh, critical geographers, um, anthropologists, um, you start to realize that it makes sense to talk about political climate, cultural climate, financial climate. And, it, and it's very much related to uh, power and it's very much related to position. So what are the prevailing conditions what are the prevailing power relations in your position? Um, what is the climate, you know, exactly where you are? What is the climate where, where I am? So it's, it's subjective, right? It relates, to, uh, it relates to position, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of intersubjective in that it is entangled, um, it's vastly distributed. So there's, there are some strange sort of cognitive dissonances that happen when you try to think on those two scales at the same time, the local, the global, uh, the entangled and the, uh, the kind of specific position. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a concept that's closely linked to nature. And this is, this is from an email that um, a, a guy that I, I got to know called Manuel Prieto sent me. And he just started talking about um, nature, which I'm gonna to read to you because uh, I thought this was an, a useful definition. The hegemonic approach of the concept nature sees it as something that exists in a binary relation with respect to society. Under this perspective, any human actions appear as impacting a pre-given nature that precedes any social relation. However, critical human geography has a long tradition in questioning this notion by highlighting how ecology and society are inevitably metabolized by power relations, a mainly political economy. Thus human action does not impact on nature, but produces new natures, where there are winners and losers, both humans and non-humans. In current times, capitalism is the dominant productive economic system of new natures, uneven natures where power asymmetries are reproduced and not all the costs and benefits of this production are equally distributed. So what I'm getting at there is, um, well, well, we'll come on to that. And what is storytelling? Of course, today I've, I've, I've called today, uh, Majid said, uh, and in the program, this, this, this lecture was called Climate Anthropocenes. I think that was a bit of a clerical error because um, Actually, this workshop is called Storytelling Climate Justice. Um, and of course, what is storytelling? Uh, why is storytelling relevant to climate? Well, storytelling is time-based. Um, it involves characters who are engaged with each other in relationships of power and conflict. And again, it's dependent on a particular position, okay? A narrative point of view. 
essentially from here, uh, that looks like this. So climate and power um, and storytelling are really ideas that are, you know, bound up with each other. And I think, you know, you could go so far as to say, as soon as you use the word climate, as soon as you start trying to describe climate, um, you are going to begin storytelling. And it's worthwhile being aware of that. In the sense, you know, yesterday, uh, Satchit was talking about the myth of objectivity. Okay, there is, there, there is no objectivity um, in climate storytelling. And at the same time, there is always positionality. Okay, there is no universal position from which a climate story can be told. Um, so um, this, myth, this uh, propensity to um, adopt an objective or a universal voice in climate storytelling is something that we have to uh, be very wary of. And I'm just going to uh, um, share a little bit of reading just to enlarge upon that a bit. Um, TJ Demos has a, a book called Against the Anthropocene where he kind of lays out the position against, of course, um, the term the Anthropocene, one I'm sure we're all sort of very familiar with, uh, a geological age, which is defined by um, uh, human agency, where human agency has become the defining factor that uh, is influencing the ecological development of, uh, of planet Earth. And the term comes from the Anthropos, uh, Greek meaning uh, human or mankind. So which humans are we referring to uh, when we use this, this Anthropos? And TJ Demos writes, the Anthropocene thesis tends to support uh, such developmentalist globalization, joining all humans together in shared responsibility for creating our present environmental disaster, exploiting further its universalizing logic. logic. The Anthropocene concept makes it easy to justify further technological innovations in the Earth's systems via geoengineering, as if the causes of climate disruption can be its solutions. In such narratives as these, Anthropos serves to distract attention from the economic class that has long benefited from the financial system responsible for catastrophic environmental change. As noted by Heather Davis and Etienne Turpin in their insightful introduction to art in the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene is not simply the result of activities undertaken by the species Homo sapiens. Instead, these effects derive from a particular nexus of epistemic, technological, social, and political economic coalescences figured in the contemporary reality of petrocapitalism. And so this is where we get different names which are uh, proposed to Anthropocene. Um, people talk about plantation a scene or how a capital a scene might be more um, uh, more suitable terms and um, I'd encourage you all to read a book by uh, Catherine Yusof that came out last year where she talks about how even these um, you know alternative framings in themselves are um, acts of storytelling which are told from a particular position and that position centers uh, certain cultures, certain histories, uh, certain uh, organizations of knowledge, and it erases others. And it tends to be the, the Eurocentric colonial position that is centered. What or who get marked in Anthropocene origin stories? Origin stories bury as much as they reveal about material relations and their genealogies. As the Anthropocene proclaims the language of species life, Anthropos through a universalist geologic commons, it neatly erases histories of racism that were incubated through the regulatory structure of geologic relations. Thus, becoming post-racial through anthropocenic speciation is a foil of the humanist trickster, one that places an injunction on the recognition of historic modes of geopolitical mattering while maintaining unequal relations of power through continued environmental exposures framing the epoch as a new condition that forgets its histories of oppression and dispossession. And I think it's out of this that um, we've been seeing uh, a shift 
um, in uh, public attention from uh, sort of climate storytelling to uh, climate justice storytelling. I was on a march in London and um, I met a group of uh, people who were from an organization called uh, Wretched of the Earth, of course, named after the France Fanon text. And um, they wrote an, an open letter to Extension Rebellion, which I'll just read a quote from. Greta Thunberg calls world leaders to act by reminding them that our house is on fire. For many of us, the house has been on fire for a long time. Whenever the tide of ecological violence rises, our communities, especially in the global south, are always first hit. We are the first to face poor air quality, hunger, public health crises, drought, floods, and displacement. You look past the vast intergenerational knowledge of unity with nature that our peoples have. Indigenous communities remind us that we are not separate from nature and that protecting the environment is also protecting ourselves. In order to survive, communities in the global south continue to lead the visioning and building of new worlds free of the violence of capitalism. We must both center those experiences and recognize those knowledges here. So to get involved in a climate storytelling project then necessarily involves an awareness of your own position. Um, and I think Suzanne Dalival puts it really well. She's an activist based in London. She says, develop deep solidarity, be quiet and listen. How can my resources be in service is what, in what is already happening on the ground? Right, so that's a very uh, uh, kind of long-winded way of uh, getting back to the project um, that I worked on. But the point is that I'm, um, that I'm trying to underline here is that uh, positionality is central, um, that, that kind of universal humanism, think of the kind of David Attenborough voice that you might see in a, a kind of BBC documentary. You know, you'll have a view of uh, perhaps uh, an ice cap cracking and he'll talk about how, and he'll be using the universal we. Okay, we are responsible for this and we are going to suffer for this. It's the kind of, we are all in the same boat uh, mentality. Um, when in fact, we are not uh, collectively or equally responsible and we do not sort of collectively or equally um, experience or, or suffer the, uh, the effects of climate change uh, to, the, to the same level. Um, So I had this idea that I wanted to do something about the climate monster. And I had this idea that I wanted to experiment with how I can use my resources to be in service or in collaboration with something that's already happening on the ground. Um, let me just check the time. Okay. And, um, so at this point, I was talking to uh, my wife, uh, Carla, and we were trying to think of examples of, uh, you know, possible climate monsters. And she was uh, told me about how in, um, in Chile, I'm going to show you Google Maps, um, that uh, there is kind of uh, a narrative that um, the desert is moving. So the center of, uh, of Chile is here and uh, it's a relatively kind of fertile area. And then up in the north of the country is, you know, the Atacama Desert, the, the driest desert in the world. And then down in this sort of semi-arid re arid region, there's kind of a narrative that the desert is moving south. It is moving from north to south and that land here is becoming drier uh, less fertile, less hospitable to agriculture and, uh, and, and uh, the human activity that's been considered traditional there for many years. So I started sorry. looking. Oh, we oh. can't actually see the map, sorry. Oh, you can't see the map? No, no, if you could. Okay, one second. Yeah.
Okay, can you see now? No. no. Ah, yes, no. Yeah, okay. So, sorry, just to go back a little bit. So, you can see it's sort of a greener, more fertile region down here. Driest desert in the world up here. And um, here, there's a region where there is this narrative of uh, desertification taking place. And I found this um, organization on the ground, which is called uh, Un Alto en el Desierto, which is um, uh, a kind of self-managed agricultural community, which is putting in place uh, sort of strategies and developing expertise uh, to uh, slow the, um, you know, this process of aridization and also uh, to um, find strategies of uh, continuing to thrive uh, with less and less water. And I sent them uh, an email and I said, um, hi, I'm an artist, I'm a musician and a, uh, and a filmmaker, and I'm uh, working on a storytelling project about climate monsters. Um, could I come and visit you? And um, this guy here, Nicholas Schneider, he uh, replied to me and he said, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I found myself in uh, a place, the, a, a village uh, called Peña Blanca. It's a really beautiful place. And um, I met uh, Nicholas who is uh, a geographer. And I met uh, Daniel, who is the, the, the president of this society. Um, and then they introduced me to uh, a lot more people who uh, live in the community. And um, I, I started recording interviews. Um, and I started asking about the, um, asking them about the, just to tell me about the, the situation and about their, you know, about their actions, their kind of ongoing activism project that they already had in place with an alto in Um as a, as a, as a sort of climate um, uh, crisis uh, location, it, it kind of has, um, a lot of the hallmarks that, that you know, when people theorize about climate, this, the, the, the kind of local and the, the dispersed in the sense that um, because of global warming, the glaciers are retreating in the mountains at the head of the drainage basin of the valley that this community sits in. And so the runoff water in the springtime, which fills the subterranean aquifers gets less and less each year, and there is less reserves of water under the ground. So that's kind of a global um, cause of what's happening. Another thing that happens is a more um, to do with extractivism. There's mining in the mountains and the mining activity uh, intercepts the water before it has a chance to run into the drainage basin. So that's to do with um, local policy that's to do with um, uh, national policy and also to do with a, a kind of globalized, a global network of, uh, you know, extraction, export, um, uh, processing, manufacturing and consumption. And it's also to do with uh, management of land at a, a very specific local level. So you have these kind of overlying um, uh, causes of the, of, of the problems that are happening here, which are sort of more and more dispersed, but the effects are very much concentrated in a local area. And strangely enough, they're not recognized in Chile. Nicholas was saying to me, you know, we have, you've come to visit us. We have people coming from the Netherlands. We have people coming from Korea, but no one comes to visit from Santiago. So what started to emerge was that there was an objective to share this story um, to find a way of having the situation to be addressed within Chile, to bring attention to the story within Chile and to foreground the knowledge and the expertise that was being generated on the ground 
in this place, which is also not being addressed, um, to get across this sense that uh, solutions are being developed here, which would be of wider value if they were to be recognized. Um, so I had this problem then, this challenge of saying, okay, well, how do I contribute, right? I've turned up here, I'm a, I'm a musician, I'm interested in filmmaking, I'm interested in working with sound, how can I contribute? So at that point, it's up to me to start making proposals. Um, as I said before, I'm very interested in working with sound. So the first thing I started doing was making kind of uh, sound uh, collages, which um, I thought would be interesting ways of, uh, of, of, of sharing um, what I was recording there. I'm just gonna read a bit from, um, oh no, maybe I'll play you something first. Where's it gone? There we go. The photo of my is here. He brings to the human being. What did this person say? They said, El árbol me da, me da sombra. The tree El árbol gives me shade. Me da la, la madera para el marco de la puerta. El mar, Tree el, gives el, me el wood árbol for the door. es el larguero de la marquesa que descansa mi cuerpo. The tree is the frame el árbol the that gives rest to my body. Me da la sombra que yo requiero en el calor. The tree gives me the shade y, that I need when it's hot. Y enumeró tantas cosas que no me acuerdo. And he said many things. He said the tree is present in the life of the human from the day that he is born. And it's a companion through all of life. That's what he said. It's a companion through all of life. From the door frame. This house. This house is still made of wood. Still, these houses are not made of metal. That's what he said. So. I'm playing with, with kind of operatic uh, storytelling ideas there. You know, I just started making experiments um, and, uh, and sharing them. And, and of course, you know, th th there's a certain amount of, um, you know, I think there was an expectation from Nicholas when I first arrived that I would make a kind of pretty straightforward um, documentary. Um, but of course, th the contribution I, you know, I felt as if I could make well, firstly, whenever I recorded interviews, anything like that, I would edit them and share them with Nicholas so that they could use them on their website, so they could use them, you know, in any kind of communication activities that they were already doing. But that my uh, contribution would be to make some kind of different film that was um, a storytelling project, which was more about uh, communicating the reality of the experience um, that, was, that was going on um, in Peña Blanca and that kind of, exited the language of the sort of climate documentary, which I felt like was so heavily loaded with this, uh, this kind of universalist perspective that, that I, I didn't think it was worth, uh, I didn't think it was impossible, I didn't think it was possible to sort of proceed with that language um, and not fall into the, the traps that that language has become so loaded with. So I wanted to make this kind of more experimental music type film. And um, I realized that I wanted to um, really work with, um, one second, where does this go? Essentially to work with a kind of operatic form, 
right? I mean, I think of the music video really as being the, the, the 21st century opera equivalent. If you think that, you know, opera is something that begins with music and text, and then later on is staged, right? So a visual, uh, spatial, experiential element is added to it. I think the music video, um, and especially now we're starting to see more and more kind of extended music videos, people are uh, imagining um, using the video, the music video for more than say promoting songs, right? So you've got something like the uh, music films, so to speak, of Khalil Joseph when he's working with Kendrick Lamar or uh, bands like The Blaze um, who, you know, compose music and at the same time are making uh, storytelling projects um, and there's sort of an like a parity between like how important those two parts are to their to their practice. So I was um, I felt as if my contribution would be to make this music video opera type project that would that would uh, address the experience of what was happening in Peña Blanca, and that we could then use. Um, well, I'll get onto that later as to how it should be used. Um, so as well as using sort of documentary uh, type uh, interview material, um, we played with characterizing the, uh, the, the, the kind of climate monster of the desert, um, playing with this thing that was supposedly arriving, which of course is not a real thing. It's a, it's a, it's a monster, it's, a, it's essentially a geo-imaginary. And, um, and also with unsettling this notion of the end of the world, because of, of course that's another uh, example of where we sort of lapse into the universalist uh, idea. Um, worlds end and worlds have been ending um, violently through oppression, uh, coercion, dispossession um, for hundreds of years. And um, sorry, Sorry, something happening in the street outside. Um, and so I wanted to unsettle this notion of the end of the world. Right, I think I'm just gonna get on with it and show you the film now. And then I'll open up for questions. And I think we can also start talking about, you know, what happens next. Um, we had a particular set of objectives that we were trying to achieve with this film. And we tried to fulfill them by using the film, you know, in a certain way afterwards. We organized screenings to happen at the uh, COP25 in Santiago with a QA, and a we organized a film tour to take place around the country. Sadly, quite a few of those were canceled, A, because of the uh, riots in Chile and the curfew that was imposed, and, and secondly, because of COVID. But um, that sense of uh, making something which can then be put to use in a context is something that I'd like us to talk about in the workshop today. But I'm gonna show you the film now, it's about 50 minutes long, and then uh, we'll still have time for some questions afterwards. Uh, you can put questions in the chat and uh, we can talk in about 15 minutes. Can everyone see this screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. Of death, 
to the blooming cheek of love. I see how the world is Selected its features as It was ugly then. Bueno, bueno, estamos en Chile, en región de Coquimbo, eh, frontera sur del desierto de Atacama, provincia de Limarí, comuna de Ovalle, comunidad de Peña Blanca, y es un territorio que ha sido históricamente por siglos, por más de cuatro siglos, eh, cultivado de trigo. El tema medioambiental generalmente se, aso se asocia a, a programas espectaculares que uno ve en la televisión, de lo que pasa en otros lugares, muy lejanos de donde uno vive, pero... Eh, yo creo que el tema medioambiental está muy cerca de uno, o sea, está en su casa, está en su huerto, está en el, en el día a día, lo, lo, lo afecta a uno. Porque el desierto se nos viene, o sea, se nos viene, estamos al sur del desierto de Atacama y cada vez ese desierto avanza más hacia el sur.
Hay personas que pueden trabajar en una industria que no, no tienen ni idea de dónde viene lo que, está, en lo que están trabajando. Entonces, la gente de la ciudad está nula en cuanto a eso. Eh, aquí el climático está más, más ignorante que los, que los que vivimos en el campo. Está más ignorante por eso, porque ellos viven en, otra, en otras condiciones. ¿De dónde vienen todas las materias primas? Claro. Pero no les importa porque ellos viven cada vez más solos. Mire, quisiera contarte un, una situación que nos pasó en una escuela rural donde nosotros, con la cual trabajamos. Un día un chico de unos ocho años nos llevó a conocer su casa. Una casa muy precaria, un lugar donde tenía sus animales, sus cabras, burro, caballo. Y yo en ese lugar no vi en ninguna parte donde hubiese agua. Entonces le pregunté a él yo de dónde sacaban el agua para los animales, el agua para ellos. Entonces me dijo, nosotros compramos el agua, me dijo. Ah, sí, compran el agua. Sí, compramos, eh, cada cinco días compramos agua para nosotros, para beber, para ducharnos, y le compramos agua para nuestras cabras, para nuestro caballo. Le digo yo, ustedes compren el agua, sí. Sí, dijo ella, a veces cuando está escaso el dinero, o sea, dejamos de comprar el pan porque tenemos que comprar agua. Cada vez más solo, cada vez más cerca, cada vez más cerca, cada vez más pobre. El futuro es muy difícil. Esa es una dura realidad en nuestro país. Aquí en mi campo, hay muchas cosas que... La gran parte no lo entiende, la gran parte de las personas no lo entendí. Mire, una vez yo en una actividad, alguien tuvo unas palabras para, para dirigirse a la vez un árbol, a los beneficios que el árbol le aporta al ser humano. ¿Qué es lo que dijo esta persona? Dijo, el árbol me da, me da sombra. El árbol me da la, la madera para el marco de la puerta. El, mar, el, el, el árbol es el larguero de la marquesa que descansa mi cuerpo. El árbol me da la sombra que yo requiero en el calor. Y, y enumeró tantas cosas que no me acuerdo. Que dijo él, el árbol está presente en el, en, el, en el ser humano desde el día que nace. Es por referirse a lo, a lo que son las plantas, de él se refirió a un árbol. Ya lo veo aquí en mi campo. Me acompaña durante la vida. Lo acompaña toda la vida, fue lo que dijo esa persona. Lo acompaña toda la vida. El árbol acompaña al hombre toda la vida. Es el sostén del techo Hoy día... de mi cobija. Los primeros que están sufriendo eso son las personas que viven en el campo. A lo mejor cuando llegue a la ciudad ese problema, los del campo ya van a estar adaptados y van a tener a lo mejor las soluciones. Pero el problema va a ser grande cuando falte el agua en una ciudad. ¿Van a estar preparados? Cada vez más seco. Cada vez más seco. Yo veo... No, yo voy a ir. Yo soy dos por ahí, bebé. Es muy necesario. Porque lo obliga. Aquí en mi campo, cada vez más cerca. De hecho, mi hija tiene 10 años. Por otra. Me decía, papi, ¿sabe qué? No me voy a ir. Cuando tenga dos, usted sea. A otro país, ¿por qué? Porque con esa mirada yo que no puedo esperar nada. ¿Por qué? Porque no veo un futuro acá tampoco. El futuro es muy incierto. Yo veo aquí en mi campo cada vez más solo. Cada vez más seco. Cada vez más pobre.
Are we still here? Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's um, let's let's do some questions if anyone has some, and then um, I'll move into introducing the the workshop uh, task for the day. Brilliant. And anybody want to ask a question? Do you want to come off mute or raise your hand or type it in the chat box? Um, hi, thank you. Um, my question is, if you had to do something differently, what would it be? Because I'm sure you've watched over that video so many times and obviously the, the process is one stage and then obviously producing it as well. So 
Just wondering yeah. what you did done differently. Well, it's all process, really. I, 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 what I want to get more experienced at uh, is the... Yesterday, I watched uh, Satchit's talk. I don't know if anyone saw it. He was talking about working with non-professional actors. Um, and this idea of kind of leading uh, a kind of storytelling project with a community that can then um, essentially doesn't have my name on it at the end. You know, at the end that says like written and directed by Tom Burke. Um, whereas the kind of uh, projects, a couple of the things I'll show you in references for the workshop later, um, I, I'm more into the idea of um, sort of creating an ensemble um, with that community or group or whatever it may be for that project. Um, because it, it's not really necessary for, well, yeah, I think that's the answer to the question. Um, Ananya, do you want to come off mute? Hi, okay, no. uh, can you hear me? I hear you, yeah, yeah. hi. Okay. Hi, I just had a comment that it was a very haunting and uh, very um, very different from you, uh, like a film. And I was so, so surprised at seeing such a great, uh, kind of, uh, such a devastating and such a scary situation. Such a scary situation that uh, the, uh, the climate change has posed for us. I really, I really uh, noticed something that in the last part of the uh, film, you juxtaposed uh, W.B. Yeats's uh, poem, um, The Second Coming in the song. And it was, it was so haunting for me. It was so haunting because I always imagined that, that poem to be associated with climate change and any kind of apocalyptic change. And that part was very haunting for me. I was, I, I'm literally shivering after watching the whole thing. And congratulations on such a beautiful and not really beautiful, I mean, haunting. Haunting is the word that I would think. Haunting. Uh, Peace and I, I was I am just in good I'm having goosebumps right now. Thank you for this experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ananya. Tom and and Tiger and asks, I should like to know what the first track was called. Um that was um so I okay, and this is another question. This is another thing I would have changed. I, I did the, the the kind of the text and the the kind of sung uh, parts once I got back to Amsterdam with a Dutch opera singer who was absolutely incredible. Um, ideally, I think that part of the project should have happened um, kind of in uh, Peña Blanca as well. Obviously, it would have been very different, but we should, I should have found a way to make it happen there. But I worked with uh, Stephanie Janssen, who's an opera singer based in Amsterdam. And um, as, um, as Ananya pointed out, the, the text is kind of a com uh, like a composite of um, different sources. Um, and in that first section, it's actually mainly from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, which is this kind of seminal romantic monster text um, of the, the kind of um, God creator. Uh, and um, and we, com we composed it ourselves in the studio. Brilliant. April, do you want to come off mute? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, April. Hey. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo what Ananya was saying. It was so beautiful, but also very haunting. Um, I also love the way that you laid it out. Um, but I wanted to ask so you said the people you were working with expected sort of a typical climate documentary um, and instead you wanted to do something much more experimental I just wondered how you managed that pushback and sort of managed their expectations and sort of made them see the worth in what you were doing mm. so I mean one of the things that is sort of obvious to some people and not to others is that the last scene is kind of a dramatization of the moment in the interviews when uh, Guido says that his daughter has said that she's going to leave. Um, and so that was something that was discussed and it was discussed whether um, they would want to perform that dramatization, which, which he didn't. Um, and he didn't want his uh, daughter to be involved, but they were happy to go ahead with the experiment of doing that, uh, of, you know, casting, in this case, dancers in that role. So, you know, it was very much a process of experimenting and then um, 
seeing if it works. So, you know, I, I would propose an experiment and we would try it out. There were a few things that got discarded. There were a few things that worked and they were put together and that kind of became the film. So, um, you know, a lot of it's sort of like kind of reaching in the dark um, and no one, you know, it's possible, no, no one really knows exactly what's happening. So yeah, the managing expectation thing is tricky, um, but at the same time, um, Nicholas, for example, he was very happy in the end that this, this sort of different thing emerged that, you know, he could see some sort of truth in. Um, so I think it's just a question of, of trying to be as clear as you can and then just going for it and seeing what happens, showing it to people. If, if, if it works, it works. If it's not, get rid of it. Great, thank you. Has anyone got any other questions at all before we... Um, I've got one more. You said that you presented this at the COP25. Well, no, because it didn't. It was oh, cancelled. Yeah, yeah, OK. So Are you gonna, do you think it's going to be carried on to next year? I hope so. Everything's kind of um, sort of went kind of dormant at some point. But yeah, I feel like that's something that still needs to be done. And I, I think that's kind of um, part of the sort of reciprocity, right? For me being kind of um, given permission to, to um, kind of enter that space and work and, and, and work on this project is that it then, it, you know, it has to be used. Um, so I'm certainly going to be um, trying to find opportunities. And, you know, it has been shown at certain festivals and those have been used to sort of draw attention towards the organization and what they're doing. But I'll certainly keep trying to find more opportunities for that. If we could organize some kind of Q&A, like in Chile, which involved, you know, people from the government as well as people from uh, Peña Blanca, that's, that would be the, the ideal. Great. Any other questions at all, guys? On that note, we can... Uh, well, I was just going to... I was going to ask, um, for those of us who aren't professional filmmakers, but would love to sort of explore it as a medium further, um, obviously your, set, your film had different sections. Um, I just wondered how you sort of map that out as a process sort of like, and then sort of film and record and stuff. Yeah. Um, to do with that, basically, do you do it? Do you just experiment loads and then form the story around that? Or do you fit everything you need to within the plan? Yeah, um, so I, I really felt as if the, um, the, the kind of center of the story, um, I like working in like three acts. It's just a, a way of kind of organizing things that I think is a, you know, it's the, it's the oldest storytelling methodology and it's a good place to start. Um, but I felt as if the kind of the core, the center had to be um, the section, you know, in Peña Blanca. And I had um, already done some filming, um, which was a little more cinematic. And I actually then experimented with just recording on my phone with a kind of gimbal, um, which is what I ended up using because um, I was determined not to kind of romanticize um, the sort of that location. Um, and then the, the first section, um, I got in touch with a guy called Marcos Segas, who is a photographer who works, he does sort of an ongoing series called uh, Water Mining and Exodus in the north of Chile. And we, I, I, I just was talking to him about his work and he invited me to go with him um, and to kind of um, yeah, accompany him on one of his sort of expeditions for a few days. And he actually ended up doing quite a bit of the camera work uh, from the first section and the drone stuff. And, you know, I don't have a lot of fancy equipment and he uh, lent me a few things. Um, and then the third section, um, I wanted to get some kind of budget to, um, you know, actually film this, you know, I wanted to do these experiments of, of kind of reenacting or dramatizing things that had come out of the interviews. Um, and so I managed to um, get commissioned to do a music video. And then I managed to persuade the crew to also film 
these scenes um, basically uh, on the, on like the following day using the same equipment and managed to like persuade the higher people to like give us a deal or whatever. So kind of like snuck in this little shoot um, on the budget for something else. So yeah, that was how I managed to, how those three kind of sections came about. Brilliant. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to stop uh, the recording there.